Hi everyone. A very warm welcome to the fourth edition of Traveling Photographers uh, going live on the Cinema Nature Trails Facebook page from Colombo. Time here is 1100 hours and I got a very, very special guest today all the way from Perth, uh, an explorer, uh, evolutionary biologist, and a man whose work spans across five continents. But when I asked my dear friend how he likes to be introduced, the simple man he is, he said, simply scientist, explorer, and dad. A very good morning, Dr. Ruchira Somavir. Thank you, Jitaraya. It's a pleasure being here. Thanks for the invitation. Such a pleasure to chat with you, Ruchira, this morning. And again, uh, let's welcome all our friends and viewers on uh, Facebook Live for the fourth edition of this series. Uh, uh, it's been exciting so far. Uh, we've gone in uh, with three discussions with uh, celebrity status photographers. But today, I'm, I'm in discussion with a different type of a photographer, uh, basically a, a hardcore scientist who uh, really is passionate to use photography to popularize science findings. But before we get into that subject in the and, and his amazing uh, discoveries and progress is made across the world, let me let me uh, talk to uh, Ruchira. We like to know how it all began, Ruchira. Your school time. Uh, I know you school in Trinity, and uh, I found out that your parents did an amazing job sending uh, you and the brother into this uh, wonderful school in the hills. Uh, talk us through the, the formative years. Yeah, um, I mean, basically, we are from a very, very simple background, very simple family, but my parents went way outside their way to send uh, me and my brother to Trinity, which, which gave us a, well, it opened many doors for us, um, mostly with contacts. And large part of my life coming now, going into biology, started at Trinity, and that is due to the background we had there. Um, I actually want to thank uh, Professor Karen Breckenridge, the then principal, who, who who was the previous head of the zoology department at University of Peradeniya. So he was our principal. So he was actually promoting these a lot. And at the same time, there were a couple of old Trinitians, uh, Dr. Channa Bamradeniya and Dr. Madhav Migas Kumbra, who are now, uh, neither of them are in Sri Lanka. But as old Trinitians, they were promoting, they were at Peradini at that time as, as postgraduates. So they were promoting biological work in, uh, at Trinity too. Yeah. So all these, um, all these at school level kind of opened the door and, and laid the platform, the foundation for, um, for taking this path in biology. I mean, just to be around those three amazing men would have been an amazing story, wasn't it? I mean, Dr. Madhav, Dr. Channa Bamradeni, and, and you, you speak very fondly of Professor Brackenridge, who was the principal of Trinity and his affiliation to uh, the, the subject you were in love with you know, at a, such an early stage would have been a, almost like a, a slingshot for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he, he so uh, Professor Brackenridge uh, was a specialist in amphibians and amphibians and reptiles are clumped together in the bigger world called herpetofauna for no obvious reason, like there's actually no reason, there's no biological reason for that. Yeah. Uh, but we call them herpetofauna and clump them. They don't, they don't look anything like the same. Um, but that herpetology background started at Trinity and through um, Chan, uh, uh, Chanaya and Madhavaya, I also got to know um, Anselm De Silva for, from Peradeniya back then. Yeah. Now, since I could walk, I have been keen on catching things and learning about stuff. Uh, animals. So my parents were very supportive of that. They actually, unlike quite a lot of Sri Lankan parents who who push, who, who has this massive push to become a, for their kids to become a doctor or an engineer or any of those professional jobs, I was given complete freedom to follow my path, which which for me was a huge thing. And um, and part of that was at a young age, I, I was exposed to quite a lot of these things, including a series of newspaper articles that Anselm de Silva wrote. So he was my, in this field, he was my kind of mentor to start with. And I yeah. still work with him quite closely after 30 years. So um, so all these things, I think uh, the family support plus the background at school and some of the old boys, what the, and uh, Dr. Um, there was also Dr. Kushant Ennekon, who was a who was a leading botanist, but he was an old Trinitian. So there were quite a lot of Trinitians in this, uh, in the biology field at that time. Um, Mr. Jayanta Jawadhan, 
for a few yeah. people who were actually running programs at Trinity, which as kids then, uh, for myself and especially two of my close friends, uh, Dr. Senai Karnaratna and Dr. Kanish Kukula, both of them are leading scientists in the field at the moment. The yeah. three of us started our roots at Trinity. I mean, Dr. Anselm is such a, uh, such a legend. I had this great privilege about a year before when I did a little uh, documentary on crocodiles with a British group and I, I, I worked with Anselm for a week. Uh, oh my God, such a character, and such a lot of energy. I can imagine the influence he had in life with you. Uh, but I also like to uh, just touch again on um, the kind of freedom your, your wonderful parents gave you because I know uh, once you did your ALs, uh, you, you were selected to the medical college and many parents, I must say, would have been really, really cross with a son who then uh, opts out to do science subjects and not become a doctor. That's, a, that's an amazing freedom they've given you and kudos to such wonderful parents. Uh, like I did quite a few uh, extracurricular activities at school, so I had the chance of um, using those opportunities to, to, uh, to enter into um, well, medical college. But that was, that was not an interest of mine, plus this, this was my life choice, uh, biology. And, um, and with quite a few other mates uh, from Trinity, they, the, there's, there's three of us who started our roots there. Uh, Kanishka, myself, and Senani, we all ended up doing our PhDs in um, in Australia, and now the other two are are quite leading specialists in their own fields. But the the life path has been quite similar to um, similar for all of us. You know, it's kind of almost a, a coincidence, but a funny one that our paths crossed back 12 years ago, and. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was almost one of those moments or a presentation I did back at the Peralinia University at the request of my dear friend, Gihan De Silva, who had, suddenly had to kind of fly out of the country. And he said, look, Chitra, I had to go and do a little talk for these university grads on uh, herpetology, and you're going to have to do this because I'm not in the country. I said, Gihan, that's not a subject I'm not really good at. And here I was in Peralinia with, uh, with a bunch of, you know, kids studying this and a couple of professors seated in front. And my heart was racing, you know, much faster than 72 beats per second. <laughs> but it was really funny. I can remember very colorfully that I actually had a posted a little quiz at the end of that one hour. And you happened to win that. How wonderful is that? Yeah, it's it's actually crazy. Like we, I think we have been connected through social media and else, elsewhere. However, we have not met each other. Yes. Apart from this one incident about 20 years ago, I was a... Uh, I'm pretty sure I was a first year undergrad at Peradeni and you came to give a talk at the veterinary faculty and quite a few of us attended that because we did, this is this is this is what we wanted like wildlife photography stuff learning about things and um yeah I actually have that book it's um I managed to dig that out it's Wild Lanka I think with you and Ravi yeah, yeah. yeah my dear friend uh, late Dr. Ravi Samarasinga with whom I had the great pleasure of doing this yeah, so I, I remember, um, yeah, there was a quiz and I won there was something about wildlife and I won that. So this was my gift. So this book actually is the first connection and the only connection we have in person. <laughs> a colorful <laughs> little memory, but yeah, that was a, that was a heart raising moment for me to get through those 60 minutes with you guys, the audience. <laughs> Well, let's 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 go back to thereafter. You know, you 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 you've done your, your degree, and then you had a, an amazing stint uh, also at the University of Cambridge. You you did some work at Harvard and the Natural History Museum in London. Talk us through that uh, wonderful journey of how you then went, took your work well beyond Sri Lanka, where I know you always wanted to look beyond the shows. You wanted to work in an international uh, arena. Uh, talk us through this uh, wonderful uh, journey through Cambridge, Harvard, and to the and to the Natural History Museum. Um, it, like um, since school age, I actually wanted to because I was I I saw the uh, because I saw what our old boys, the the people that I looked up to, was doing, and not just limited to Sri Lanka, but just going out. I always wanted to be that and um, and uh, work towards that. So while I was at Peradeni, I got an internship from Cambridge to work there for three months uh, with the Natural History Museum. It was a bursary through Cambridge, um, where I actually went through some of the type specimens and all specimens of reptiles that uh, from Sri Lanka that are deposited there. The idea was to make a digital library because not many of us get a chance to go there and see these specimens. 
So this, um, my idea was to actually make it freely available for anyone. Um, it's there were a few technical issues with that, but that was the aim. Uh, I also had the chance of working with uh, Harvard University in a couple of uh, summer schools in Borneo and elsewhere. Then um, uh, I, in, in this journey, I got to know about this person, Rick Shine, Professor Rick Shine. He's like, he's like God in when it comes to ecology of reptiles. Like, uh, so I always wanted to do my PhD, my postgraduates with him. So if Rick was in, I don't know, some other country, I would have gone there, but he happened to be at University of Sydney. So it's not... So because of that, I, I contacted him and said, like, look, this is me. I I have this urge to do something with you and give me a chance. So we discussed, I, I managed to actually secure all the funding and scholarships needed. So I ended up in Australia. So um, Rick, that was the standard of hardcore research. Uh, this is a for anyone in the field, like reptile ecology field would know this lab. It's one of the leading labs for reptile ecology research in the world. So it was a huge privilege to um, join that lab as the first Sri Lankan um, and, and work with him. In fact, I'm his first Asian student. Um, and yeah, yeah, so that opened many, many doors. Having a, being a part of a big international lab, you get to know people, you make a lot of contacts, networks. Um, then I, after my PhD, I actually did a, a postdoctorate with the CSIRO, which is the uh, which is the Commonwealth Institute of Science and Research, the yep. National Science Academy of Australia. Yeah. Uh, so I, I did three years of research with them, and now I still work for CSIRO as a research scientist now. So Professor Rick was the magnet that kind of brought you to Sydney, uh, but now your work spans across five continents. Talk us through the perspective of some of your work and how and and how passionate you are in using photography in popularizing science findings. No, for sure. Um, so um, I actually, so we, we have quite a few projects happening um, uh, in other places. Uh, large focus is is Asia, Southeast Asia, and Northern Australia. Um, like my main research is in is happening on crocodiles and sea snakes of Northern Australia, but I have projects elsewhere from uh, South Africa to parts of Asia. Yeah. Um, I have a close collaboration with some um, U.S. institutes um, and so on. So, so I have listen to some of your previous uh, programs in this in this series yeah now i am i have seen the people the caliber of people that has been on this show before um they were very acclaimed international photographers i am absolutely not one of them so i i won't introduce myself as a photographer whatsoever because i'm not i don't have the technical skills or any of that knowledge i use but i I use photographs a lot to tell stories. Yeah. My, as a scientist, one huge um, shortfall I see in the field of science is that scientists do amazing stuff, but we rarely talk in a language that the end users or the general public understands that. So yes. there's a huge wealth of scientific knowledge in these scientific journals that only other scientists go through. Yeah. So I have, been, I have, I have, for a for a while, I have taken a keen taken a keen interest in actually taking those science findings in in mediums that is easily um, understandable to the general public. So my talk today comes in a completely in that perspective. So I'm not going to talk about I have I've seen the previous episodes. I have um, like I'm not going to take about the talk about the technical side of uh, photography, which I have zero clue of. Um, I'm going to talk about the perspective of using photography, how how I have been using. So this is a personal journey. How yeah. I have been using photography and the points that I think are important to highlight okay. um, when you are using photographs for telling stories. So let's listen to the journey in that point of view. Yep. Um, should I share my screen? Let's do that. Yeah. I mean, the first yeah. segment. Let's talk about large versus small. Because the common perception is that apex predators and charismatic animals, you know, takes the main seat. Uh, all the photographers are chasing the big animals, the megafauna. But sometimes the smaller things are the coolest. And some of the stories about your 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 blue layer finding out these dragons, I mean, it's just kind of mind blowing. So, so talk us through this uh, that journey, Ruchira, and how 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 you were intrigued about. 
these blue layer findings and 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 giving a voice to the smaller type of species sure can you see my screen now very clear yes sure so i i mean it's no different like it's no secret that he, as humans we have a liking for big things if you if you talk about photography like the big five like every country has its own form of big five elephants leopards tigers lions to all the big stuff is so appealing and that's that's there's nothing wrong with that like but if you go to most of our like social media it's sri lanka is a typical example like we see millions and zillions of photos of these big things yeah. right i i don't think there's any story left to tell in that in those animal groups because we have been photographing them so long yes. and and some amazing photographs yeah and and th that doesn't stop at uh, stop at the big five like even the the colorful big things the, even if you take the birds like we love the the awesome colorful big stuff the raptors the hornbills this is a male uh, weathered hornbill from uh, java that we um, it's in one of our sites yeah so things like these are naturally appealing but i have i try to have a balanced view of using photographs to tell stories so i i photograph i looked at the whole spectrum and for me some of the smaller things have awesome stories to tell like way better stories or way appealing stories or way interesting stories and lately i have taken a keen interest in what we call the blue layer yeah now when you see this thing it looks like an alien it looks like something from not this world right because Absolutely. it's so different to an animal that we think of now this is a blue dragon it's a it's a very unique animal that spend the entire life floating in the uh, in the uh, earth's oceans now he's not alone in this journey he has four other friends right yeah. so what you have here this top one is um, let me see whether you can uh, okay can you see this guy yes yes yeah so that's the say uh, uh by the wind sailor this is called the blue button this is a velvet snail and this is called the blue bottle now these four animals it's a group we call it the blue layer they're actually right at the surface of the world's oceans yeah. floating their entire life around the world using currents now how amazing is that these guys eat each other not only that they have some absolutely fascinating stories to tell for example if you take this guy the blue bottle yeah it's actually made out of four organisms now this floating thing is one thing that takes him around these yeah. long thing they are called zoids these are four different types of zoids together making one animal okay these guys catch food the long ones and pass it on to these guys who digest it and these guys breed so how you can't think of any big animal that has a absolutely bizarre life story like that yeah right so for me these small things are so fascinating and and i spent quite a lot of time beach combing with my kids looking at these things after a storm the beach is an amazing place to go and look for things because anything that floats just get washed over so we find all five of these just right next to our house uh, in the beach yeah. and um, and i try to take photographs and actually take these stories to the um, to the public if you are following me on facebook or, or instagram i'm more active on facebook this is something i regularly do every week i post something with a snippet of okay this is this animal this is why it's fascinating and and I, I, there's nothing fancy about any of these photographs like as you can see here i photograph them in a wine glass using my headlamp as a light source that's that's yeah. that's simple as that is right um is i use a light box for some of the photos but most of the lateral shots are in a wine glass so it's this time it's these small things that needs a voice in my opinion and photography can actually give that voice because they have nothing as there's nothing that you can't go on a safari and see any of this stuff right okay. you, you have to okay. go out you have to find these things yes. but they have amazing stories themselves um a similar thing happened in borneo last time we were there we were driving somewhere to one of my sites and the and the and one of my mates who a local mate and a driver mentioned about this fish in the place that we were passing through and this is how good smartphones are nowadays right i went on google scholar at the moment and like then and there and then google this uh, about this world smallest fish he said like okay we were passing through this uh, swamp peat forest and he's like 
Or did you know that the world's smallest fish, which is also the world's smallest in, uh, vertebrate, lives in this water? And um, and I was like, far out. Like, how many have seen the world's smallest and vertebrate, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. So we are immediately went through the uh, the papers, and the papers actually gives the type locality, which is um, in non-science world where the where the the first or the main specimen that describes that species was discovered. And it gives the GPS location. We immediately put it in our own phones and it find out that it's the location is just a kilometer ahead. We happen to have some nets and um, we actually went and just dipped it there. And you can, what you see as like a cut in my finger, that's actually the world's smallest fish. It's, mm -hmm. um, and that's a breeding female. So imagine that thing and elephants or blue whales share a large part of the genome, right? These are things you won't normally see, but look how photography can actually give a voice to these things, right? So I love to actually, when I tell a story, I like to give it a personal touch. So I like to show, okay, we were there, we were catching, this is what the habitat looks like, but this is the target animal. Yeah. So some of these smaller things have amazing, amazing stories. And sometimes we, it's very easy to miss them. Um, for example, this guy, Right, so all it looks like is a um, uh, uh, is a leaf hanging on a on a uh, spider web. Yeah. But in fact, it's a group of spiders called uh, Poganata, the leaf curling spiders. These guys, they actually hoist the hoist leaves from the from the uh, floor using silk, and they curl it up. So it's not a leaf that just happened to land there. Next uh -huh. time when you see these things, have a closer look because Nature is absolutely amazing. The smaller world, like these guys, actually get a leaf from the bottom, like the from the floor, curl it, and lives inside it. So it's the home of the spider, right? And yeah. so, so it's very easy to miss this world. And as you can see, to to photograph some of these stuff, you don't have to go to Yala or you don't have to go to a national park, have fancy gear, right? You, these, these are things in your backyard. This is backyard science. And that's uh, he, that's where photography gives a voice to these things. Very well. I mean, very absolutely. well. I mean, this is just absolutely stunning because these are things you could be, you know, thriving in your back garden, and you would probably never know. Un unless absolutely, and, and it's 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 crazy how much biodiversity we have in our own backyards that we completely ignore. We want to see the big, sexy things, so we spend so much money and trying to go and spend hours and hours in traffic just to see things. If you are, if you have an open mind and just go to your backyard, flip some rocks and logs, there's plenty of things to see and photograph in your own backyard. And some of this stuff, if the closer you get, the more you see. Now, in in Sri Lanka, the, this this species, it's called a whip spider. Amphipig is a, is the group they belong to. It's an arachnid, same as a scorpion or a spider. Yeah, they're absolutely common. Um, you you can flip some um, some rocks some logs, you'll actually see these guys in most wet places. And they have this amazing life history that they carry their babies on their back. Now, when we think of parental care, we think of the big things, all that all that gorilla was holding its baby, all that, that whale calf was um, swimming with his mom. Of course they did, but like the small world also have those, uh, all those behaviors happening. Yeah. Right? So these guys lay their, they carry their egg sac on their, on their belly, and when they hatch, the babies climb onto their back and stay till the first morning. Yeah. Now, this is not thing, these are not things that you normally would pay attention to, but I think, I hope um, this is something that you will take up from here because the, you don't need to go to any national park, any pristine forest, none of that. This is science and photography in your own backyard to see a world that we don't normally pay attention to. So that, so I'm, so today's talk, I'm gonna do in five different perspectives. And that my first one was big versus small. Yeah. So I, I used those last four slides to tell that, look, it's not only the big things that matters, the small ones also need a voice and photography them is so easy because it's there, it's just there. You just need a curious mind. It is, and 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 the, and the motherly affection and the care these little spiders take on their babies as as just as much as the, the as a, what you what is very evident in a herd of elephants. 
but it's just that often often it's unseen and almost unfairly not appreciated why so it's up to us to see these little things and you know if you might not like that animal as much as you would love an elephant but show the same respect it's a, it's a part of the chain amazing amazing ruchira let's talk absolutely. about absolutely i mean uh, it's very easy to analyze so for we, it's a humane effect right we 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 relate to animals that show human behavior yeah. it's a, it's a very common thing that's why like but when the australian bushfire happened bushfires happened everyone was like when we see one photo of a koala yeah. suffering like everyone's heart melts like oh my god we need to donate there that koala is burning yeah. zillions of reptiles and small animals died in those uh, in those fires that we we actually don't even think of right so it doesn't mean any less value for those lives very true the next segment you 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 wanted to speak about the sexy versus not so sexy species i'm i'm quite quite, quite intrigued by that because you know as, as in this massive chase of photography in the world we always go beyond the behind the charismatic species but there is so much we don't see in the generally unseen the the Absolutely. ones you call not so sexy talk us through this yeah no for sure so i mean again it's it's very normal to like being in love with a charismatic species if you go to india you want to see tigers if you want to go if you go to africa there's a zillion things to see but you want to see the big cats it's um it's 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 a natural loving if you go to yala if you don't see a leopard that trip is an utter waste for many people right <laughs> yeah it's a, that, that's that's very normal um but as a as a um scientist who has a broad interest from in things and as someone who wants to give a voice to the unheard things i actually try to think beyond that um so i, I was in um i was in kruger trying to um doing some work plus uh, getting a project design and i was driving by myself and i came across with this cheetah and, and obviously i mean come on they are sexy species so when you say sexy i'm referring to the the charismatic things the things that we love we yeah. love to see more than once right so i was i was in like i it, i was just driving myself it was right next to the road we had a like 5 minutes moment just the two of us it was amazing that just the on the opposite side of my car there was a small water hole right and while this after, just after the cheetah i was um, i saw this bird walking around this guy i'm having a video maybe it is uh, it is a bit uh, uh, broken up Very but fine. yeah this is a hammer cop now it's yeah. a it's a absolutely weird bird it, it's it's it looks like a heron or a egret right but it um, yeah. it it has its own family called scopidae because it's it's the one member in that family so this this hammercock was next to me on the other side and i was like oh okay i have never seen a hammercock or oh, i i didn't even know what that was so i was like oh that's a bird that i have never seen so i just started taking some photos and um, a video and this thing flew into a tree next to next to the water hole and on that was this right so this is the hammercock nest for for a bird they make one of the largest nests nests in the animal world nests in the animal world now that that is a egyptian goose you can see for a size comparison yeah. there's a um, studies show that there's at least like 50 60 other different type of animals that make nest or live in these nests so this small bird who's smaller than a, a like a size of a, a little egret mm -hmm. um podicoca yeah. um is he makes this massive house so i was actually i was way more keen on things what's going on there rather than looking at the um, like looking for the for the cheetah again because i'm sure zillion people have seen cheetahs but not many people have focused on the hammercock nest nest and for me that was absolutely interesting that a small bird makes this and it's a we call them ecosystem engineers they 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 create a completely different system that many other animals benefit right so so uh, so for me telling the story about the hammercock after that trip was way more interesting than the cheetah which was way more sexy by the way however for me this was way more uh, cooler um so i i was using photographs to take that story across saying that hey guys did you have you heard of the hammercock it's this uh, not so sexy bird but it yeah. it changed the environment in such a way that so many other animals uh, are benefiting right 
it's the it's the um, same with if you go to Borneo, um, the sites I work at these guys, which obviously is a is a very charismatic, sexy animal, the, yes. the orangutan. Yes. Um, the the fascinating thing, the word orangutan means um, orang is human, otang is a forest, so the uh, the human of the forest. But it is not actually a local name. It's um, the the locals never used to call them that. The um, that's a name the British actually coined, thinking this is what the people call them because they look like the, the humans of the forest. Um, now there's three different species: the Sumatran, the Bornean, and the Javan. Um, so this is the Bornean one. Now. If you go to where they live, this is a draw card. Everyone has their fancy lenses trying to photograph these guys um, because they, they're charismatic. Yeah. If you look a little bit up in that same, not so attract, attractive as adults. Now that's a silver lutang or the silver langur, um, the genus uh, Trafficus. Sri Lanka also has them, the leaf langurs, the leaf monkeys. Yeah. Now, this uh, species, Christatus, um, I find it fascinating because when they are babies, they are golden in color. And um, after about three to five months, they change color. So I, I was actually following that story, why these guys, um, in a science point of view, how on earth and why on earth is something that obvious? Because you, you expect animals to be camouflaged. You expect animals to not be obvious in the environment. Yeah. And then you have this golden cute thing jumping around uh, whereas the adults are gray and boring ass um and so for me that was a much awesome story so i was i was actually photographing these things to um, find out why that is and tell the story of the silver lutang instead of orangutans which which don't get me wrong i mean they are amazing yes. but there's so many people telling that story whereas these guys are kind of ignored um, for me, it's the same if you go to my one of my other main sites, the uh, the Komodo Islands. Believe yeah. me, that's like my second home. I absolutely love that place. Um, and Komodo dragons, you can see a zillion of them, but you'll never get bored out of them. Yeah. They're actually one of those things that you want to see in the wild. Yeah. Um, majestic creatures. But if you wait till the, the night falls, and if you go spotlighting in Komodo, you you might be lucky to see one of these guys, um, the blue pit viper. Yeah. Out of the entire world, these guys only lives in Borneo. Uh, sorry, uh, in Komodo Island. Just to give just to give an idea, Komodo Island is smaller than um, the district of Kandy. Like it's it's it, it's like one tenth of Kandy. It's a teeny weeny island. Yeah. Right. It's um, and from the entire world. That's the only place these guys live, and that's the only place where you can actually see them. So I spotlighted this animal quite a lot in media, and this photo has actually made it into some amazing places, um, giving spotlight to this creature that that uh, calls Komodo home. So it's not just the big Komodo dragons that attracts people now. There's plenty of other things to see, including these guys. This is truly stunning. I really wish. You know, as we discussed, I, I want to be there photographing this chap over the, the, the larger species like the dragons that generally steal the show. But I mean, what a beautiful picture. Uh, and you said that this actually made into several magazines. Or, uh, yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah. So it actually even made it to National Geographic. Um, I, I'll, I'll talk about it at the end. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we so so the, my first point was uh, telling photographs to tell big versus small, and the other one was sexy versus not so sexy. Um, I also try to use photography to bring an experience versus showcasing an animal. Now it's very easy um, to uh, not not easy, but like our normal focus when you see something is to photograph that animal. Yes, it's it's, it's uh, that's pretty that's pretty normal and that's pretty awesome. However, if you are telling a story, it's not very relatable to people, right? Mm -hmm. You don't feel like, oh, I'm experiencing that. I'm actually there looking at this animal. So while photographing things, I always try to take a photograph of the um, of my experience, and yeah. that that that's where selfies comes in. Now, uh, when you heard the word selfie, you you automatically think of something shallow, like I'm just showing off. Yes. Not necessarily. It's uh, it's how you use it. Right. Um, so, for example, 
Um, this is um, this is me in um, in um, in Africa somewhere, and um, I just saw I just saw my first uh, giraffe. For me, like I have seen plenty of giraffe photos. That was nothing special for me. Like uh, a photo of a giraffe was nothing special for me because I I've, I've seen plenty of them. But I actually wanted to cherish that moment. So this tells a bigger story for me. Like I was by myself. I was right next to it. And I actually was, uh, I was there. So I think as photographers, and if you're, if you're a science communicator especially, yeah. and if you're using photography, sometimes it's very easy to connect to people when you make it your personal experience than the target. So uh, if you, like uh, National Geography, for example, runs a science training boot camps, what they call, and they have sessions on photography, and they always talk about five photos that you need to make a complete story and one is an experience. Yes. So it, ex, cherishing an experience is, is hugely important. And that doesn't, and when you're, and when I say uh, selfies, there's a way of doing that. The selfie doesn't have to be harassing an animal, holding an animal um, and, and making a fool out of yourself, but you can, without any of that, you can respectfully actually do that to cherish a moment. So I always try to do that um, while my subject also matters, that experience also matters. So. That's another way of uh, photography, telling, uh, using photography to um, to tell a story. Uh, that's a simple um, technique, isn't it? I mean, we, we generally, I mean, I've seen tourists, hordes of tourists who are, who are always conscious about them being in the picture than the animal. Now, that's the common way of, I would say that, as you very correctly said, the shallow way of portraying a selfie. But but the, the better way of doing it is to capture the habitat, capture the, mo capture the moment, and also try to, you know, interpret how that moment felt in your heart. And it kind of create, connects the dots into creating that little story of how beautiful was that first experience seeing a giraffe in the wild. And it, and it then conveys a story of not only your feelings, but where that animal lives and how close you got intimately to that moment. So that's, that's what we like to actually share with the younger photographic generation. Think beyond uh, that picture and and always try to capture something that can tell the story. Absolutely, I mean uh, you 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 nailed it. Um, it like you you necessarily don't have to see the whole world through your viewfinder. Um, it's only one of the many ways of looking at the world, right? You can take a step back and include you in that bigger picture too. Yeah, and if you responsibly do that, I think that's a way more powerful story to tell. Um, and also a way more powerful uh, XP, uh, a, a moment to um, to treasure. Um, you you rightly fully said about natural environment. Now I'm going to. That's another thing I would actually tell as a science communicator. Like we, what is a natural habitat, right? We we this is this is true. This is pre, like a very specifically um, applying to herb photographers or people who photograph reptiles and amphibians. Now. If you go to some of the Facebook groups that uh, regularly uh, are, have a huge followership on reptiles, Sri Lanka has some some of the most active groups. There's some big big Facebook groups on reptiles. Yeah. You see these absolutely amazing photos of perfect reptiles, lizards in these moss covered rocks, in these mad, beautiful backgrounds. Blah blah blah. If you are a scientist or if you are an actual explorer who has been to these places, have seen how they live in the wild. Yes. You rarely see an animal like that, right? It's not natural. It's it's an awesome photograph. Don't get me wrong. It's a yes. photographically, it's bloody awesome. Yes. But is it natural, or what do we call natural? Now, I want when I when I take for I, again, don't get me wrong. I have done that many times, and I still do that sometimes. Yeah. But I also try to showcase things as it is. Now, for me. If you want to tell a realistic story, that matters a lot, right? If you put a photo of an animal in a pristine environment, like pristine background, and say like, oh, this animal is being uh, 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 being threatened by deforestation, that doesn't connect you to that absolute story. So it, it matters how you actually showcase an animal. So when you say natural, it doesn't have to be this pristine wildlife, right? A pristine wilderness. Natural for an animal can be your backyard because they are looking at it in a completely different way. For him, that's absolutely natural. 
yeah. Uh, so this uh, this is a, a, sh a short snouted cobra that I was photographing in um, in um, in an Af uh, village in Africa, um, yeah. and my story was related to snake bites there. So I wanted to show that this is this is exactly how we encountered it while crossing a path um, uh, close to that village. And I wanted to, rather than moving it and showing it in this beautiful natural African savanna, uh, because this is how an average human will actually see that animal most times Absolutely. when you are walking the path. There was a limit. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so I was doing my very best to actually capture that uh, that moment that look at this is a cobra and this is where you normally see them. So. My point is that natural doesn't have to be what we think as natural. That's our perception. That's our view of natural. Yes. Um, another example from Australia, this is a Litoria cerulea. We call them the green tree frogs. And they come in a lot of shades of green uh, and yellow. Um, if, you go, if you go out at nighttime, they come out for feeding. You see this on, uh, on leaves and other, other uh, places. But if, you, if anyone has ever seen them during daytime uh, around human habitats, this is how you see them, right? You see them in anything and everything they can crawl into. Yes. If you want to study that, and if you want to understand that animal, if you want to study the ecology of that animal, that matters as much as this, right? So my advice for any young photographers is that, look, it, it doesn't have to be this pristine photo of, okay, this is, this is where this animal lives, because it's not the case. We call these uh, we call many animals native opportunistic fauna because they actually adapt when habitats change. They adapt to live in that habitat, yes. and this is a far, large part of my research group here. We look at how animals adapt to a changing world. That's that's actually my research theme in many 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 of my projects. So I always try to capture that moment that okay, this is what natural life is for these animals. And brilliant, brilliant, absolutely. Uh, so, you, so don't restrict yourself to this, this sexy backgrounds with uh, with moss covered trees and blah blah blah. Because many animals don't live like that. If yeah. you want to actually tell the story of an actual real life animal, tell show it is as it is because that is the reality of it, and that's that's give more justification for that animal. Very true. I, I want to recap that at the end for the younger photographers. Let's move on to the drones versus helicopter work. I do play with a drone myself uh, in a very restricted country of uh, not being able to use it wherever I want to. But I know you use drones very, very effectively in your scientific research. Uh, let's let's share the, the the progress you've made on the on drone photography and research and the connection between the two, especially in the Africa. Yeah. Um, so I'm, uh, I'll just use a couple of other examples. So, um, the most of our work in Australia is in very remote places in the outback, so there's no road access. We we, we talk we are talking like hardcore serious remote places. So I spend a lot of time in choppers. I've spent a fair bit of time in choppers every year. Um, it's absolutely amazing to see the world from from a different angle, right? You, you it's a it's a completely it, it opens a completely different um, opinion. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to drones. Uh, we, our research team here in the, uh, my research team is called Ecosystem Change Ecology, which is under CSIRO, and we use a lot of drones from LIDAR to photogrammetry to multispectral uh, and more recently hyperspectral. So we use drones a lot to answer scientific questions, but drones also are an amazing tool to tell stories. This is an Australian um, sea lion. We, we have a colony in an island close to my home. Um, they are pretty amazing seeing close by. They're actually um, they're absolutely fascinating animals. Our natural tendency when we see something is to get as close as we can, right? It's um, it's how how much the frame is covered with that animal. Yeah. But sometimes the closer you get, the more details you you lo you lose, right? You 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 get into this tunnel vision. You only see that animal. You don't see the bigger picture. So drones, as you can, as you said, drones actually opens up a completely different world in this perspective. If you take a step back, or if you go a few meters up in the air, this is how you see sea lions. Now, this photo for me tells a much bigger story about its life, right? That it lives right. in this wilderness island, um, and it, it is surrounded by shallow waters where these guys feed and eat. And during the daytime, they they bask as uh, as groups. Um, in in the water's edge, 
Now, I wouldn't have said any of those stories with a photograph close by. Right? No, there, so, is, a, there is a lot of tendency, Richard, uh, these days for people to go eye level, get close, use wide angle lenses so that I know, I mean, I'm a photographer myself, so it kind of opens out that amazing uh, angle to show an eye level photo of an animal. But if you really want to go beyond as a nature photographer, as a person who can share the animal story and connect the species with the with the habitat it lives, which without which that species will, will be non-existent, this yeah. kind of angle still the story, isn't it? Absolutely, and uh, but be very careful. I mean, drones like in Australia, we use them very often for uh, for work, and there are a lot of regulations plus a lot of ethical considerations. So yes. just because you have a drone and you can fly it, that doesn't mean you should be just going and doing whatever you want. Um, there are it's very easy to disturb an animal. It's very easy to destroy a habitat. It only takes a crash drone to start a fire. So yeah. um, so there's a there's a there's a level that you need to be conscious about. Yes, but drones do tell uh, a drone photography has opened this completely different view about the world, plus uh, how animals live. And um, you just mentioned about wide angle lenses. That's another tool that's commonly used, and I use that a lot too. Yeah. Um, because that instead of just a shot, like a shot of the animal, it it tells what it where it lives and the interactions. Now this is a photo of a stingray, and over here there's an eagle ray. And you can see that, look, these guys live in this open, shallow water and they actually, they are together. So sometimes getting the closest, you lose a lot of details, right? So when you're, a, if, you're, if, you, if you're using photography to tell stories, sometimes it's actually easy to get a step back and see the bigger picture. Then you, you see so many stories within that story. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do with these things. Um, and so, so yeah, as I said, uh, what natural what natural versus artificial, yeah, drones versus land level, uh, um, and um, and uh, wide angle lens, all these are different tools to tell stories in different ways. Which I'm I'm pretty much intrigued about your passion to popularize science and build bridges between scientists and those who manage uh, builders. And also that other aspect, which often people forget, we, we do a lot of research, we share it with those who manage the habitat, but often we forget those who live with the wild animals, because that's the people who actually has these animals in their backyard, who has to go through some difficulty and stress often in living with them and also trying to protect it. Share the story about this and how you uh, want to shed more light on this aspect. Uh, I, I think I think you um, you touched a very important play, uh, uh, point there, Chitralaya. The um, as I as I said at the beginning too, I have a keen interest in actually taking science to the general public, and uh, and every time I uh, every time myself or one of my students or uh, a team we publish something, we do rather than talking about that rather than rather than talking about Rather than talking science, I talk about science. I take that and use photographs because scientific charts and and uh, and graphs and p values they mean nothing to the general public. They don't mean nothing to a wildlife manager or to a or to a villager that li that lives have to live with that animal or that conflict on a daily basis. So we always take take attempt to make a story out of the papers. The paper is for the scientific community, but then we do have like uh, the social media uh, publicity for that paper, always accompanied by photographs and things that people can relate to. And um, for that, um, uh, I, th I think photography is the most effective way. Yeah. Um, and also the and also the, the 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 wording you use plus the language. So I, I depending on the target, I actually use Singhala a lot um, in some some mediums. Especially in videos, yes. um, and and um, and English uh, elsewhere, but I I think if we uh, and by no means this is dumbing down. This is not dumbing down. I'm um, uh, a story. This is telling the story in a different language. Very true. I mean, just just making it simple. The findings are simple, more accessible, understandable to those who are not in that scientific league, and that's that's a key thing. It's a key thing. And, and I've, I've worked with a, in my time of running ecotourism and wildlife based tourism, we've done some, 
fundraising for research. I've had the great pleasure of working with a lot of scientists in the country. And some of them actually pay a lot of attention to what you just said, of trying to, you know, uh, be more inclusive in their findings and sharing it in a language and in a manner where the common man understands that that's a huge deal in that. Rochira, let's talk about, because we're also in this program of traveling photographers, fancy gear versus smartphones. I know you too, you, you, you joke with me about, you know, sometimes the GoPros and the smartphones can actually do a lot more than uh, a $10,000 piece of gear. Uh, talk us through uh, your efforts in trying to document the story of the natural world with uh, not so expensive gear. I mean, um, the, so fa fancy gear, um, I, I personally don't actually have much. Um, it, I, so the full stop there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> simply I can't afford to some of the, some of the stuff needed. Um, even, even if I can, some of the, it's, it's one thing if your whole trip is in a, is in a, uh, is in a comfortable four wheel drive and if you're going around photographing things, but if your journey is on foot or if you're camping for days, if you're, if, if you're in a remote area, these, these, these parameters change, but one, some of the smaller gear that we carry with ourselves regardless opens a completely different set of doors in this, in these scenarios, right? And I'm talking about smartphones. Now, smartphones nowadays have some amazing optics and um, and, and uh, processing capacity. Um, some of the some of the new Samsungs to um, the new iPhones. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing what they can do. So I always, I mean, I'm, I, I always have my phone regardless, of what. Um, and I I use that quite quite a lot to actually document what I see. And one cool thing that I often use that I don't normally see people using that often in storytelling, uh, storytelling um, point of view are panoramas. I think that's a very powerful tool in um, in smartphones that you can do within seconds. That if you have a fancy camera to, to create a photo like this, uh, post processing, yes. it's it's it, 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 it's a lot of work. In a in a camp in a phone now, it's like bam, you're there, right? Yes. <laughs> And so, and, and panoramas have their place. Like for example, it, it tell, it gives the idea of a landscape, like for landscapes, panorama are absolutely amazing. So this is a waterfall in an island called uh, Aug uh, Augustus that a couple of us uh, choppered in uh, to look for crocodiles. So the crocodiles have never been actually recorded there. And we got some anecdote information that they're there. So yeah. I, uh, along with some uh, indigenous rangers, some parks and wildlife rangers, I went there looking for these guys. And look how amazing this place is. One photograph wouldn't have tell that story. So uh, this whole, I, I use a lot of panoramas to document and um, and tell stories of where I work. And sometimes it's not just the location. Sometimes it's telling the habitat of an animal. This is a this is a herd of feral cattle uh, camels that um, I bumped into in a place called Kimberley, and uh, it tells you that open vastness, that aridness that like this is where these guys live, right? So it, it tells that, it tells way, a way bigger story than just a photo of that camel. Yes. And um, and the remoteness, like this is a place called Vinjana Gorge where we have a long-term project happening on crocodiles. But this photo just rather than that croc, it tells like, oh wow, it's a, it's a scenic place. It's this shallow water thing. There's a boat in the background, which we go and catch stuff. Yeah, it, it's a bigger story. Yeah. And um, sometimes it's also the scale. Now that's a that's a boab tree. Um, uh, a photo, one photo wouldn't have done justification for that that photo that tree. Uh, if anyone has seen boabs, they are the weirdest trees in the world. Um, so I, I think panoramas are absolutely amazing tool in smartphones that you can do way better than a fancy gear, and and tell a story much more effectively. And sometimes I mean, it's just, I mean, just 10 years ago, I, we used to spend about $1,200 on these little panoramic cameras. And, and nowadays when I, when I go out on safari with my uh, junior, she is taking these amazing panoramas through her iPhone. And, you know, then I got used to it, but you know, there is this constant boy in the house between the iPhone and the Androids, but it doesn't really <laughs> matter what you use. Any of these smartphones are so smart. They can really help you create this, you know, capture the moment. 
They are, they are called smartphones for a reason, and um, it honestly doesn't matter what you're using, but most of these uh, cameras nowadays have these amazing tools that we can use to tell stories. And sometimes if you couple this effectively with your normal fancy photographs, you actually have that full picture. Very much, very and, much. And when you're traveling, uh, like I, I, uh, I, 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 one thing I love is actually going into markets. Uh, when I travel into other countries, I go to local food markets because that's where you see a lot of the new cuisine plus uh, things like this. Yeah. This is in Hong Kong and it's a bunch of uh, African clawed frogs. They are being sold as uh, fish food. Yeah. Um, so I took this photo with my phone and I immediately shared it there, uh, with a small snippet of uh, this thing. And it got picked up by quite a few people who work on amphibian parasitic diseases and uh, disease transmission. Because when you apparently keep this many frogs in one small thing, yep. they, they, it's very easy to just transmit the disease very fast. And then it goes exactly. to every time they take a bunch of frogs to another place, it yeah. just spread. Yeah. So yeah. this photograph has been used in quite a few documents now. Mm -hmm. And this was just taken with my phone when I just saw it on the roadside. Um, so it does, it, it, sometimes these, these photos that you don't think much actually are really important both scientifically and in an education point of view. And then not only phones, like so many people now have access to GoPros. When you see GoPro, you normally think of like mounting on your head or uh, on, a, on a GoPro stick. I took it to a, a, a bit different level. I actually recently mounted a GoPro on a metal uh, sheet and had a bait ba bag. So this is a mesh bag where I put a piece of bread. I live close to the ocean. We go to the ocean and we put it there. And um, uh, um, and put it in the water. Oops, it's not working anyway. So what it? Let me check whether you can. Yeah. So I put it in water with a bait and let the GoPro run for for whatever the amount of time. And just using this gadget and just a bit of snorkeling, we have been documenting fish that lives in the pool right next to our, like close to our house, yeah. right? And using just captures of this, yeah. we have, my kids and I have actually made a poster of yeah. all the all the common fish in Metam's pool, which is the location. And, and we have actually now the city council is printing this and putting it in the location in Metal. So people who are coming to snorkel there know what the fish are there. So that's a classic example. That is a classic as, example of using simple tools with a meaning where you actually end up putting up a poster for conservation and your city council takes it up and bang, you're actually now, uh, you know, uh, sharing information about what's there in your own neighborhood. Fantastic work. It's a great Absolutely. Experience. And this is nothing, this is not a $10,000 uh, uh, underwater camera, none of these. Um, this is a, uh, this is a $300, $400 GoPro that with a piece of bread. So, um, so you don't you don't have to think of all the big stuff all the time. It's um, fancy. Obviously, with tech, with money, you get more uh, like higher resolution and all that facilities. However, it, it's a it's a it's how you use it and what do you use it for. And leading that comes to our last point. So I was I was talking about four, four points so far: big versus small, yes, sexy versus not so sexy, yeah, showing uh, experience versus showing a subject. Yes. And lastly, fancy gear versus now like day to day things. Yes. My last point is something that's very dear to my heart is um, ego versus impact. Mm -hmm. right? So yeah. we all take photos like part of any photographer, any artist, we part of that is ego. We love the attention we get out of that. And that's very normal. If you are denying that, you are absolutely lying. We all love the attention when we do something yes. cool, right? Yeah. So that's that's just being human. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, and 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 that's that's very common for me too. Some of my I love, as I said, I have never done a photography exhibition, a photo book, or I have never actually entered a photography competition. None of that. But my photographs that I've taken without any of the fancy knowledge or experience on photography has made it to some some cool places. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my photos of a cassowary was the um, the cover, fo cover photo of uh, Australian Geographic recently uh, yeah. in the photograph of the year version. Yeah. Um, and then um, uh, and and I didn't even enter the competition actually. They saw my photograph on Instagram and and posted that. Yeah. Um, 
and I have my photographs have been on National Geographic. CITES and IUCN used a photograph of a, a Kurubod, uh, Kandukura Bodhilma, I took um, yeah. a, a hump-nosed lizard that has even made it to the official sign of CITES last year, the yeah. exact photo. Um, photo. This is a turtle I photographed at Ashmore Reef, which is a, a isolated reef system in Timor Sea um, uh, into, uh, uh, into identification and management protocols. And so and so, and I use photographs a lot for books. I have uh, for books and posters that I write and do. Um, so this is all good. This is all ego, in a way, because personally, I don't think none of these animals, or I, I, I'll be lying, but large part of these animals had no impact of me photographing this animal, right? Yeah. For me, it was awesome. I, I, like I, you see, and Red List has my lizard as the cover photo. It is it is amazing for me personally, right? But for that lizard or for that species, that that meant absolutely nothing. Yes. Lately, I have tried to while I'm while I'm getting actually I'm loving the attention. I have tried to move that focus into the animals. And one and I've done quite a few things in that today. But like one thing that a science communication tip I did um, was quite effective in that sense. This is now this, yeah. Talk yeah, this is this. a civet cat. I, I know this story and I, I it really deeply touched my heart and 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 share the story with our viewers, uh, Ruchira. This is quite amazing. So absolutely. So I was in Bali. Uh, I I do quite a lot of work in Bali. So I was in Bali and I uh, came across with this village um, with uh, civet cats. Now, if any one of you have to be in Indonesia or parts of Malaysia too, you have, must have might have heard of Kopi Luwak. Kopi luwak or civet cat coffee is uh, is one of the most expensive type of coffees in the world. Uh, if for a coffee no snob, uh, that's something that you normally try, right? So yeah. the idea is that the the idea you hear is that okay, civet cats or kalavat does eat uh, eat the coffee beans. They poop out the coffee seeds, and it's that seed that you grind and and give it, and it's 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 medically better and it tastes better. That's the general idea. So. You charge amazing amounts of money to for these uh, things. There are actual science, there are actual chemistry studies showing there's absolutely no medical difference uh, or any chemical difference in these kopilua beans versus any other bean, right? This is absolutely myth. -bust. This is an urban urban legend. Yeah. So there's nothing. There's no scientific value, uh, scientific truth whatsoever to that story. I saw how it's done in some places. Now these guys not are. These civet cats are not only in cages, they are tied up inside this tiny cage for their entire life. They are being force fed yeah. um, coffee beans and the poop is just, they, they, their whole diet is just coffee beans, right? And then their poop is being sold for, for hundreds of dollars for fancy people to drink coffee. Yeah. I posted this on, um, on Facebook and it actually, I, I was I was amazed. It was uh, it was shared close to um, uh, close to forty five thousand times, and um, and in multiple platforms. I actually uh, I stopped the comments after a while because it was just becoming a bit too much. Yeah. The number of uh, so I, I I so all my photographs are accompanied by a small text saying what it is, and this is what I wrote. Yeah. But anyway, I what I what I got was overwhelming. I got messages from at least six cafes in Bali saying, we came across with your post, we double checked and we realized it's true. We have stopped stocking Kopi Luwak. Right. Right? I have got so many feedback from travel groups saying, um, we, we saw this and we actually okay looked into it. This is, this is something that we thought of doing it in our trip to Bali next time in my wildest dreams, I won't be doing that. So I think that's impact. It's just, then this photograph is from a small uh, smartphone. This is not even a fancy camera whatsoever. This is just my uh, my iPhone. So I think photograph can be an amazing, powerful tool to actually make a life different for an animal. So it doesn't have to be all about you, the, the number of likes, the number of all those maps. Of, of course, you are doing it for, you, you get, motivated by all that. But then again, sometimes it's not just the ego of the photographer. It's not about all about you. It's actually sometimes about the animal. So I, I if if 10 cafes stop stocking, um, stocking uh, Kopi Lua, 
Yes. That's less demand. That's that's more that's few more animals that don't have that suffering. Well, it can right? be so the start of a major change of attitude. I mean, this is this is a, such a heartwarming story uh, because I think as human beings we have this natural tendency, isn't it, Ruchira, to chase experiences and. And in today's world, with you know smartphones and 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 social media, you can create an, a story of an experience, and a lot of people who wouldn't know how that experience is made about will chase it, buy it, uh, share it, and market it uh, on of word of mouth. And then you would know that a, a, a very innocent animal is struggling for its life for you to just sip that coffee or anything else for that matter. And this is where. Uh, using photography for opinion change, as you have done in the Kopi Luwak story, is so much near and dear, or should be near and dear to dear to all of our hearts, rather than chasing that one ego image that can make a thousand likes and make make yourself more popular. Look beyond, young photographers, look beyond that moment where you collect the thousand egos to be more popular into changing opinions. Wow, that was fantastic. No, no I, 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 I couldn't agree any less, um, Sanjana, because when we see an animal in a cage, it's not something that we think of photographing. We we, we want to see, oh, I want to photograph a calavada in the wild, right? Yeah. But that animal in that cage actually might have a much more stronger story to say. So it's not all about your image as a as an acclaimed photographer. It's sometimes actually giving a voice to that unheard things. So for me, I think those five points as a science communicator, more than a photographer, as I said, I'm, I'm no, I'm no um, brilliant photographer whatsoever, but I, I love taking photos and I use those photos in a way that we can change opinions plus change how we see the bigger world. Before we uh, come to the last segment, uh, Mr. Gayan Vijayathunga has sent in two, two questions. I'd like you to shed some light on this. So Diane is asking Ruchira, what do you say? Uh, okay, the number one is what is the best or unforgettable moment you as an ecologist has had on the field? I would actually say, um, I would actually, uh, uh, that's, that, uh, that's a brilliant question. I, I would say the finding the smallest animal in the world was my, it was very unexpected thing. Everything happened within like a couple of hours. I got, I didn't even know about this thing like two hours back. Yeah. But then in two hours later, I was holding the world's smallest vertebrate in my finger, which was um, which was an amazing thing. Like you don't think of um, I have I have seen pretty much all the big cats in the wild. I have seen both species of elephants, many of them or many of them. Um, uh, but for me, that like, oh, wow, not many people have seen the world's smallest animal or the world's smallest uh, vertebrate. I think as an ecologist, that was my um biggest like travel um moment i i, I couldn't i couldn't agree with you more and i can i can imagine you know uh, getting into your shoes what a moment that could have been then also ask another very interesting question i like this question even before the other more than the other one he's asking what do you suggest for young people in the field to carry a camera or a field notebook oh <laughs> um i i <laughs> see um the, the thing and is that a lot of things have changed nowadays. Like, for example, we, um, as scientists now, we, a lot of us don't carry notebooks anymore. Um, smartphones nowadays actually have quite, quite a lot of repetitive data gathering is actually done now on smart devices. So uh, while it's so cool to have a notebook, I still have my oldest notebooks with me and I, uh, they're, they're, they're treasures to me. Like, when I was in the field with people like when I was when I was starting this thing, when I was in the field with people like uh, Mendis Vikramasinghe, um, Samantha Suranjan, Alin Pereira, um, then um, uh, Bhatia Kakulandala, all those were like my my teachers in the field when I was a kid. Yeah. Um, I like whenever they say something, I used to write it down. Like whenever they catch something and show, I was like, oh, write down all that stuff. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it plays a huge role in my my personal life. Um, but now things have changed a lot. I would say a smart device, like a smartphone actually does both jobs now. Absolutely. So <laughs> taking the photos plus taking the information um, and quite a lot of us now actually just carry, like if it is a repetitive thing, you, there are 
like there, there are platforms like Fulcrum where you can actually make customized forms in your national in your uh, smartphone to enter uh, data. Yeah. So if if it is if it is between a camera and a notebook, I would certainly take both. But if you want to reduce both that to one device, I would say a good smartphone actually do both now. I think uh, spot on. Uh, you responsibly used uh, a smartphone today access both your notebook and your field camera. And, yep. and the results you can get is, I mean, quite phenomenal in, in today's uh, technological world. Right down to the last segment. I know uh, you and I have a common thread in working with children. Uh, we both love to work with children. I do photograph with many, many kids on many camps we've had. Uh, and uh, for you, I know you have your own team at home with Rehan and Nihan. What a, what a, what a little team with... with uh, uh, Ruchira's dad. Uh, talk to us about the importance of inspiring children. Not only that, that will naturally as parents and as adults we'll, we would want to do, but talk to us about the importance of taking children young to the field and spending quality time in the outdoors. Absolutely. I don't know whether you can see the photo, but that's... Um, oh yes, we can. Yeah, that's the three of us. So. That's uh, Nihan is the little one. Uh, he's the little man, uh, five years old, and Rehan is uh, eight. In that photo. Um, so I I'm a huge believer in getting kids early into the nature. Yeah. Um, we unfortunately it's not something commonly done in a society like Sri Lanka. We don't see that as an important thing in countries where we have absolutely bugger all biodiversity. People yeah. are pushing kids to get close to nature, and yeah. we haven't. We have all these resources, so it's very important as parents to get our kids into into nature and close to wildlife, close to animals. So I, I before my science, before my any of my other things, I'm a dad before any of that. Yes. And for me, he, opening these the eyes of these two is a huge thing. So I started snorkeling with them. I got them into snorkeling. They were uh, about three, so they used to piggyback me and snorkel with me. I spent a lot of time in water. And now both of them are actually quite competent uh, snorkelers. Rayan is even looking at doing his junior paddy this year. Yeah. Um, it's um, So when you're a team, when you get your kids in, if you, if you are expecting your kids to explore and do things, it will take a while, but if you take that initiative and take, and I know that you do that a lot, Chitralaya. I have seen you your photos of uh, with your daughters in um, in uh, photographing things and traveling, yeah. and uh, and quite a lot of my other mates uh, do that too. Like uh, uh, their kids are part of their actual group. Yes, um, I think which is very important. Now these guys uh, help me catch sea snakes or do when we do sea snake stuff in Indonesia, yeah. and. Um, uh, they joined me and this is uh, them with the Harley Quinn snake eel, which they thought was a sea snake. Um, and, but that's how kids learn. So you, getting them to be a part of your team when you're exploring yeah. opens their eyes to a huge, huge world that school will never give. So uh, my for any parent listening to this, my, and if you have already, if you haven't already done this, my biggest advice is that look, schoolwork matters. Tuition, I don't, I don't believe in tuition. We don't have homework in Australian schools, so that's great. We, uh, if you, uh, when school ends, kids, that's it, because you spend eight hours in the school, right? The rest of the time, you, you, you do your social things, you do your family things. So we, we hit a park or the beach all the time. Yeah. But, um, but it's good. Like, look, education matters a lot. That, that's para, that's paramount. But it's also important the moment you have a chance to get your kids to nature. And yeah. that doesn't have to be at Singharaja or Yalo, Vilpato, any of these fancy places. It could be just your backyard, a paddy field next to your place. Yes. These places are full of life. So all what it takes is a bit of initiative and, and that push. And I think your kids will have an amazing childhood. Very, very true, Ruchira. I can't, I can't say it more. I can't emphasize it more. The amount of uh, enjoyment I, I have when I take the kids out on photographic tours uh, uh, in, in admiration of nature. And a little bit of news for our viewers. Uh, Ruchira, whenever uh, COVID fears go away, will we'll obviously we'll be in Sri Lanka sometime next year. And we're already putting plans together to have a, a kids' nature camp 
in a very exciting occasion in Sri Lanka with Ruchi and myself and my entire Nature Trails team. So for all the parents who are tuned in, we will share with you the opportunity to send your uh, young children to this nature camp for two days in a very, very safe environment, I will say, with Ruchira leading two days of uh, uh, activities for the children. And uh, that little thing we spoke about, Ruchira, looking forward uh, very much sometime next year to be out there in Borneo with you with some uh, very exciting uh, photographers uh, from my end. So two things to look forward to. What a discussion it was. Uh, you you kind of, uh, you know, opened my eyes to a different world. Uh, myself, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a culprit of chasing the big animals myself, Ruchira. Uh, mm -hmm. Lifetime of uh, in being in love with cats uh, has kind of taken its toll uh, with a little back injuries now, you know, uh, bouncing around uh, jeeps for 35 years. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, being a voice for the voiceless, uh, uh, telling the story, uh, you know, uh, taking that one photograph, if you can, in a lifetime of photography that can change an opinion, will make you uh, one day a very, very, very happy and a contented man. So chase those along with chasing those charismatic animals, because uh, that one picture narrated and spelled out in a, a little sentence might change the opinion, which will set a thousand animals free. Ruchira, thank you very much for joining us on the fourth installment. It has been a, a such a rewarding experience talking to you. You are a young biologist, a scientist whose work is uh, very, very uh, much applauded in, in many universities across the world. And the world actually needs more men and women like you. And you're a man, I truly say I'm proud to call my friend. Thank you very much, Ruchira. Thank you, Jitra. I'm very humbled and thank you very much. Um, and once again, it's it's always a pleasure to um, talk to a fellow like-minded person. And um, I hope I, I I gave the idea that photography is is beyond about yourself. It's a uh, it's a it's a it's the best, the most powerful way of giving a voice to the unheard. Yes. On that note, use photography as a voice for the voiceless. Thank you, Ruchira, and thank you all the friends. Uh, we will be on the air again in three weeks. And until then, stay, stay safe and keep that fire burning. Thank you all. Thank you.